how could we improve the environmental footprint of our diets for real right now everybody this video also features the imaginary scenario what if everybody in the entire world went vegan hello friends of facts and welcome to fantastic studies and where to find them join us for some exciting research from scientific papers today's topic is once more diets and their impact on the environment. In 2018, Paul Nemechek published an impactful study on how to reduce food's environmental impact through producers and consumers. The authors focused on the following topics, land use, freshwater withdrawals weighed by local water scarcity, and greenhouse gas emissions. How can you calculate back from the food consumed to its associated emissions, water and land use? by collecting life cycle assessment data for the most relevant foods and food products. Life cycle assessment accounts for the total resources allocated to a product from farm to fork to garbage. For example, to produce cheese, you need to grow cow fodder, feed and grow the cow. You require infrastructure to milk the cow, produce the cheese, wrap it up, bring it to the supermarket, then to the consumer who discards the wrapping and eats the cheese. All of those steps take up resources, that is mainly water, land and energy. The sum of all those resources is collected in this specific cheese's life cycle assessment. In today's paper, the authors used life cycle assessment data from 570 studies conducted in 119 countries, covering 38,700 farms and 40 products making up 90% of global protein and calorie consumption. This is an enormous effort and a great data set to address the question, what is the environmental impact of our food supply chain? Answer. 26% of the anthropogenic greenhouse gas emissions come from food. That is equal to the entire British population, all 66 million people flying from London to New York and back again 93 times every year. Moreover, agricultural food production covers 37% of the world's desert and ice-free land. In theory, we require more than our moon's entire surface area to produce our food. On top of that, two-thirds of all freshwater withdrawals are for irrigation. With two-thirds of the world's population facing water scarcity, keep in mind freshwater is a precious resource on our planet, albeit of course in some areas more than others. Breaking it down to the individual products on our shelves, there's a high variability in each product's environmental impact even in producers from similar geographic regions. On average, 25% of producers contribute to 53% of each product's environmental impact. That means there's a substantial potential to reduce environmental impacts. Producers of, for example, cereals could just have a look at what lower impact producers of cereals do differently from high impact producers. So what could food farmers and producers do to reduce their environmental impact? Instead of establishing more monoculture, farmers could increase cropping intensity by using early maturing plant varieties, apply intercropping, plant catch crops and improve irrigation, to name just a few general examples. That way, they could grow as many plants, but with less strain on the environment. Producers could reduce packaging waste, favour production at low impact and set market standards. That could save them money and promote their product's green image. But farmers and producers cannot solve it alone. We also need to understand our impact as consumers. Here are some main points for us to keep in mind. Point 1. Meat, aquaculture, dairy and eggs provide less than 20% of our calorie intake. But they account for more than 80% of the world's farmland and contribute to 57% of our food's greenhouse gas emissions. This could be considered a little unproportional, don't you think? The impact of even the lowest impact animal products exceeds the average impact of suitable vegetable protein with regard to greenhouse gas emissions and land use. This is also true for aquaculture. Pretty much the only exception is nuts, specifically low yielding cashews and water, fertilizer and pesticide intensive almonds. Point two. 
fodder must be grown and transported to feed animals. For this reason, 67% of deforestation for the purpose of agriculture is for animal feed production. Point 3. An often cited argument in favour of eating animals is that in some areas ruminants convert grass from land which is unsuitable for vegetable farming. We must keep in mind though that this still has a considerable impact on methane production, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. This is because animals create additional emissions from manure on digestion. And finally, point four. The processing of animal products is higher in emissions than that of most other products. This is easy to imagine when you think about the additional need for the transport of fodder and animals, the slaughtering or milking, or the cooling required during and after processing. To put all of that into perspective, the authors constructed a really interesting imaginary scenario. By how much can we potentially reduce the environmental impact of our food? In that scenario, we, as in all of us, the entire world goes vegan, thereby reducing food's greenhouse gas emissions by 49%, food's land use by 76%, and scarcity weight freshwater withdrawals by 19%. Land no longer required would bind 8.1 billion tons of carbon dioxide each year for a hundred years. In other words, forests growing on the potentially freed land could take up three times of the entire EU's greenhouse gas emissions every year. It is important to note that countries contribute unequally to those numbers. For example, in the US, per capita meat consumption is three times greater than the world's average. Now, what can we do about it? Or rather, what can our policymakers do about it? Here's the author's suggestion. First, producers should be made to track their impacts using digital tools. Second, assessment tools should then provide producers with specific tips and tricks to mitigate their impact and produce more efficiently. That could include proposals for irrigation strategies or transport reduction measures. Third, Policymakers should set targets on environmental indicators and incentivize them. For example, the target is to reduce the food sector's greenhouse gas emissions by, let's say, 20% until 2025. The incentive could be a tax on greenhouse gas emissions. That would make high emission products more expensive and incentivize producers to lower their emissions. Finally, the environmental impact of the food supply chain needs to be communicated to us, the consumers. This could be achieved by environmental labels, taxes, subsidies, or simply by educating all of us on the true production cost of food. To come back to the question we asked in the beginning, how could we, the consumers, improve the environmental footprint of our diets for real, right now, and everybody? Our conclusion from the presented data is, First of all, we can simply be aware of our impacts as consumers because really, it is quite substantial. Imagine you cast a vote every time you go to the supermarket. And second, we can eat more wholesome plant-based foods. Our tip is to always keep a mindset of more. If you eat more wholesome plant-based foods, you do not even have to think about eating less animal-based foods. It will happen automatically. Want to try it out once in a while? Here are two channels with healthy and delicious plant-based recipes for you to try. Thanks for watching and see you soon.